It's a weird and wonderful world that waits below the waves of the oceans, washing the shores of the South African coastline. But it takes dedication and perseverance to find the hidden gems between the waving underwater forests along the coastline. I'm Ashley Dowds, and this is my Africa, my home. I dig deep into the past to make sense of the present. I explore the natural environment to find the driving force behind my continent's attraction. But it hides another face, an elusive side filled with excitement and packed with adventure. Hey, Ruben. It's looking a bit like pea soup. Yeah, no, definitely. The water's uh, pretty dark today. Not looking too good today, unfortunately. We call it a day. Yeah. The visibility will be about three to five meters, and it's a milky, milky color. Ruben, it's real pretty. I was really looking forward to diving here. This is the third go, and the viz is still a little bit murky. Now, this is a summary of my first efforts to diving in the colder waters of South Africa's Western Cape province. As I have said before, if there were more than four seasons, Cape Town would have them all in one day. However, just as I was about to leave Neisner, a small town approximately 450 kilometers east of Cape Town, dive instructor Odette Williams and I got a quick break to get into the channel that marks the opening of the estuary to the Indian Ocean. I've done a few dives in warmer waters, and even though moderate seas are often marked by masses of fish, these colder waters have a diversity of species and surprisingly magnificent colorful corals. We're followed by several fish species that gather around in the hope of finding a morsel of food when a debt stirs up the bottom. What I find surprising is that a variety of corals actually manage to find a foothold everywhere. In fact, I believe that any foreign objects that are dropped into the water are covered by corals in a few short months. Even fishing line that has gotten stuck on the bedrock and an old wreck that is lying in the estuary mouth now looks like a strange floating string of coral. The Neisner dive was a short one and we were forced out of the water when the tides changed and millions of litres of water streamed out of the estuary, threatening to take us with it out to the open sea. Further west, the weather stays miserable, and just as I thought that my cold water diving for this trip was going to be confined to a short half hour underwater in the Neisner estuary, I received a call from dive operator Tony Lindekew. The weather is giving us a break and the sun is shining on old Table Mountain. We're going to go and do a seal dive, so we're going to go to a seal colony out here, a few hundred seals. Uh, it's a sheltered bay, six to eight meters depth. We'll jump in the water with the seals there, they're very friendly, they'll follow you around, they'll bite at your bubbles, keep your hands to yourself, fingers in, because they can nip, but they're very playful and they'll just follow you around and you can basically just stay there and swing around with the camera and, and get a lot of entertainment from them. Temperature's about 10, 11 degrees. Visibility should be quite good, probably okay. 8 to 10. All right, so we're going to a seal colony. Our launch site is at the Hout Bay Small Boat Harbour. This harbour was built to accommodate fishing vessels. The trip to Daker Island takes only a few minutes. It's less than four kilometres from the Hout Bay Harbour and this is one of the advantages of several Western Cape dive sites. They don't require long boat trips. Hey Tony, I've never seen, well so far, I've never seen the waters this clean. I would say now it's probably 8 to 10. Yeah. You're going to have 20 to 30 here. But then the water temperature is only about 5 degrees. So, if you what is really it now? Get good vis, it should be, what does it say, Mark 12? Yes. Temperature. Yeah. 13. Yeah. 13. Okay, well, I'm kind of pacified. Yeah, 13's, just not, 13's not bad. Alright. But what plays on the senses is the pungent smell that always surrounds seal colonies. Getting into that water, underwater and away from the stench, regardless of how cold it is, is something that I'm now looking forward to. Tony somewhat resembles Batman with his dive hoodie with its two pointed ears. This helps divers to recognize him instantly as the dive master. 
At first, the young seals keep a safe distance, but as their curiosity grows, they narrow down the distance that they maintain from us. As they start to relax, they become a real bunch of show-offs, swimming straight at us, and then at the last moment, they dart away. Females can weigh up to 120 kilograms, and they can eat up to 11% of their body weight per day. What amazes me is the fact that they're so relaxed with people sharing their environment and that they never seem to run out of air. In fact, they can hold their breaths for almost eight minutes and can dive to a depth of more than 200 meters. Males are much bigger and can tip the scale between two and 300 kilograms. They're territorial, and a young male swam right up to me to inform me that I am in his domain now. Time flies when you're having fun, but then the cold knocks me back to reality. It's time to get out of the chilly Atlantic Ocean water. Hey! The nice thing about seeing the seals underwater is that you can't smell them. <laughs> because when you get up here, you really can. I don't like the smell of seals in the morning. But this was one unforgettable experience. It's like a dream sequence, it really is. And the way they're balancing with their tails up in the air above the surface of the water and peering at you. And they love to come and peer upside down at you and those eyes come quite close to the goggles. And then they bring all their mates and at one stage there were quite a few of them swarming around. That's where I wanted to be today. Woo! It was amazing. Hey, hey! Yeah. The weather fairy plays along. And the cape of storms is hiding beneath a thin veneer of summer. It's a temperamental coastline, this. So it's not quite for fair weather divers. You've got challenges like the cold water, which sometimes gets down to about nine degrees. And the visibility, which sometimes doesn't exceed one and a half meters. But nevertheless, and I'm here once again in the capable hands of Tony Lindicu. A strange shark species dating out of the Triassic period often hangs around in the shallow waters off Miller's Point, just around the point from Simonstown Harbour. And this is where Tony and I will meet. But a new addition to the old Simonstown Pier immediately catches my attention. Dennis, the last time we came down here, we didn't see this statue. I take it it's quite new, huh? Um, this statue was unveiled on the 20th of December last year. This is a symbol for the Navy, I take it. Yeah, this was actually made possible by donations from many uh, ex-South African Navy divers from all over the world who decided to put a statue in Simonstown uh, in memory of all past South African Navy divers. One of the biggest, possibly the biggest export from Simonstown is in fact Navy divers. Even now? Even now, they, they are still the most trained divers you can probably get in most of the world. Although little mention is made of the Dutch influence on this town, Simon's Town was named after Simon van der Stel, who was appointed the first governor of the Dutch Cape Colony in 1691. The natural bay provides safe anchorage for ships and has been an important naval base for more than 200 years, first for the Royal Navy and then the South African Navy. It's a quick drive by boat to the bay off Miller's Point that's situated a mere five kilometers from Simon's Town Harbour. But once we moved out of the protection of the harbour, there is a chop on the sea that makes it a bumpy ride. We're driving right into still smallish waves that are kicked up by a mild southeasterly wind. The wind may also drive sediment in the water closer to shore, and at this stage it looks like we're in for a murky water dive. Tony briefs us. Okay, so we're going to dive with seven gill car sharks. They're called broad nose seven gill car sharks. They're very slow and lethargic. But don't be fooled, they are wild animals. Don't touch, don't reach out for them, don't try and grab their fins. They'll come really close to you if they're comfortable with you. If they're not comfortable, they won't. The previous day there were reports of great white sharks patrolling the area and I am slightly nervous as we descend 12 meters down to the bottom. Kelp sways in a mild current and one of the first visitors is the red Roman fish that darts around. These fish were once plentiful, but overfishing has depleted their numbers and are best returned to the ocean when caught. 
Red Rome and Sea Bream are confined to South African waters, and one reason why they're susceptible to overfishing is that they grow extremely slowly. A fish of 40 centimeters can be as old as 40 years. They share a very unique quality with sea goldies that are found in subtropical waters. Red Romans can change their sex. In some areas, stocks have recovered satisfactorily, and this reassuring development is attributed to excellent conservation measures. Large marine protected areas where limited or no fishing is allowed are paying off. Curiosity overcomes several of these beautiful fish, and as they relax with our presence, more and more of them appear from the kelp beds. The first shark that I see is a small puff adder shy shark. They're quite common in the temperate waters off the South African coast, and the color patterns on their bodies resembles one of the most venomous snakes in South Africa, the puff adder. But the similarity ends there. These small sharks are completely harmless. They're often preyed on by another shark species, the cow shark. Being our reason for diving, the cow shark eludes us. But then one of them is outlined for a fleeting moment against the bright surface. It seems skittish and I kept on getting the feeling that something was watching me. I couldn't shake my discomfort. And then out of nowhere it appears, sliding through the water as if driven by an ancient inner force. This is the broad-nosed seven-gill cow shark. And unlike all other sharks, except six-gill sharks that have five gill slits, these ancient sea creatures have seven gill slits. Unlike their usual behavior, this one doesn't hang around, but disappears towards the open seas. Elated that I've seen this ancient survivor of the Triassic period and its natural habitat, we explore further, and then I turn cold. The great white sharks have been at work. The remains of two cow sharks are floating around. One of them had its stomach ripped out, a sure sign of great white sharks feeding. These massive predators often only tear out the stomachs of other fish-eating predators and leave the rest. This has been detected more often over the past few years, and the competition for food has been given as the reason why ocean predators often only rip out the stomachs of fish and seabirds. We leave the kelp beds of Miller's Point, haunted by the two cow shark carcasses that cast a shadow over the sighting of the beautiful predator that swam past us. Not much is said on the boat trip back to shore. Nature has its own ways. 80 kilometers to the southeast is a landmark, a testimony to the early people of the region who carved a living out of the sea. This is Hermanus. You know, it's unimaginable to think of how many fishing craft were launched from this old harbor here since the 19th century. They went out and harvested the ocean for fish stock and very soon, the subsistence fishermen came back with nothing. And that almost drained the resources of the ocean around here. Fishing boats are no longer launched from the Hermanus Old Harbor. The small canoes that are now launched here have replaced the fishermen's wooden rowboats. It's an eco-friendly tourism operation that we've got here, the sea kayaking business, taking people out to show them the wonders of our ocean. But Hermanus has become well known for another iconic species that visits here. This is one of the best, if not the best, whale watching spot in the world. The whales have moved on to the colder waters of Antarctica. But the biodiversity of the rich sea life that makes this area so special is still here to explore. I think it was the American First Nations Chief Seattle who once said that you can judge the quality of a people by the way they treat their environment and their wildlife. Maybe it says something about the good people of the Western Cape that two-thirds of South Africa's hope spots are located right here in their province. As Tracy Menkes of the Hope Spot Foundation explained to me some time ago... The hope spots really are um, just the, uh, a way of showing people that this is a place of really of great importance. And on the 6th of December, 2014, this honor was bestowed upon Hermanus as well. One of the people that can show me why this area has been declared a hope spot is Marx Moore, who runs a dive operation with a difference. Hey, Marx. Morning, Ash. How are you doing? You're the skipper yourself. today, eh? Yes, I am. All nice right. to meet you, man. 
Should we go? Sure. You ready to get in the water? I am indeed. Marks and his team use a yacht, the Ocean Quest, as a dive platform, and I'm looking forward to this. But then Mark shares the stark reality of the frigid waters of the Western Cape with me. It is definitely going to be cold today. We're looking at about 10 degrees Celsius today. You'll probably hit a thermocline on the way down. Uh, Marks, you know, I'm a Durban boy. I'm used to temperatures of around 23 degrees, 21, um, 23. I'll say to you what we say to most of our clients is just try and control your breathing. Um, control a, your breathing? Yeah, keep a close, right. a close eye on, uh, on your instructor and you'll be fine. So what's with the weather today? Huh? Oh, we had sunshine this morning, the clouds have pulled over. Uh, it looks like we might actually have some rain looking at the color of the clouds. But um, look, it is a monus. We can get three different seasons in one day. Um, let's just hope the sun comes out. All right, this wind's going to keep blowing west-northwest for the whole day, which means we're going to be a little bit choppy on our first dive, but we'll have nice shelter on our second and third dives. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. We're doing uh, mostly shallow happen. dives, and that allows us to do several of them, because at these depths, so, the much-dreaded bends, where too much carbon yeah. dioxide so accumulates under pressure in your bloodstream, meters, is virtually non-existent. Because we are doing uh, three dives today, I want us to be quite conservative on our tables. Yeah. All right? Um, so let's just work it out. I dive on a computer, my dive master dives on a computer. Um, however, the tables are still very important because you're not going to be diving on a computer. Yeah. And if anything does happen, I want to know that you can know that you're going to be safe. And then my softer side prevailed. Yeah, this is the first for me. Two wetsuits. I'm a happy man. I think I'm a blessed man. Look at this cameraman's laughing at me. The strangulation effect here. <laughs> I hope it's still working. <laughs> Open the zip first. Okay. There you go, now put on the now put on the hoodie. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That'll teach you. Stop you from shaking. Okay. Well, apart from the fact that we've got lots of room here to, to kit up and we can just enjoy ourselves on the on the yacht. The other practical reasons why you, you have a yacht for diving? Um, the catamaran has a very shallow draft, uh, so we can become, we can come very, very close to shore, especially in the kelp forest. Uh, even though Hamanus' coastline is a very sheer drop um, into deep water, yeah. some of our most beautiful sites are very, very shallow, so we can just glide over the rocks without the danger of hitting them. And then also the exact opposite of that is um, if the visibility is bad or maybe the sea conditions are rough close to the shore, uh, we're very comfortable to go a lot further out to sea to go find some uh, good diving conditions. Well, it's one thing less to worry about because I'm spoiled by two deckhands that helped me put on my gear. The rear of the yacht has been designed to make entry into the water quite easy. However, I get a deja vu feeling as once again visibility leaves much to hope for. This water is as green as pea soup, and the best way to descend to the ocean's floor is by following the anchor chain down to the bottom. By now, I've notched several cold water dives, and my initial unease with poor visibility and being in the domain of the infamous great white shark has been replaced by an appreciation for the uniqueness of the cold Atlantic water. Black bream is one of the fish species that used to be quite common along the coastline, but overfishing has depleted their numbers. This species is now recovering, and the Cape Whale Coast Hope Spot is playing a decisive role in the recovery of species diversity. A seal tries all the antics in his book of tricks to entice us to play, but sometimes it's better just to ignore them. They can become quite a nuisance once they get attention. What I find astonishing is the mass of black mussels that cover rocks for meters on end. Sharing their habitat is red bait, a strange animal that is a family of the sea squirts. Marx points out a large starfish, an animal that doesn't have a brain, but functions on a highly advanced nervous system. Thousands upon thousands of sea urchins that are family of the starfish also cover the rocks. A magnitude of juvenile marine species finds shelter under their tentacles until they're big enough to ward off predators. One of these is the commercially important South African abalone. Drifting through the swaying kelp constantly delivers new life forms. 
The Whale Coast has a large biodiversity, but the regular influx of cold, nutrient-rich water from the deep, also called upwelling, sustains a biomass of marine life that's difficult to equal. Finding my way through the swaying stems takes me back to childhood dreams of floating around weightless. Several pajama shy sharks follow us through the kelp forests in the hope of scoring some morsels of food. They're quite common here, and so are the puff adder shy sharks. Unlike many other shark species that give birth to live young, both lay eggs similar to this that they attach to underwater structures and algae. The cold water of the Atlantic Ocean offers a different experience, one that should never be compared to the warm, clear waters of the subtropical seas. It is unique in every sense, and it's not for the faint-hearted. But then, this time, I was prepared. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm always going to use two wetsuits because I was pretty warm down there. And I don't know how long we were there, but it was, it was great. But Marx doesn't share my enthusiasm. He's firmly in the grip of Neptune's ice-cold fist. Tell me, what, what causes seasickness? Look, I've been sailing since the age of six. Um, mm. I've done some big ocean crossings. I've got about 15,000, 16,000 sea miles under my name. It's an imbalance in your ear. Uh, to today, I still get seasick. I'm seasick yeah. right now. Um, it's, you know, for some people, it goes away. Mm. Uh, other people, it, don't, it doesn't. I'm unfortunately one of those unlucky people. My time searching for the ultimate cold water dive is coming to an end as we sail back to the harbour of Hermanus. It's been a long day that passed way too quickly, and the pleasant saltiness on my skin is a reminder that we're all ocean creatures, beings that have shaken off our watery past. And yet there remains this craving to return, to explore more, dive deeper, and reach out to the exquisite life forms that adorn this underwater world. Until now, I've only heard of crystal clear west coast water, often described as having endless visibility, and striving to experience this for myself, I will keep coming back. This is a unique coastline, the Western Cape. It will take years to explore and to fully appreciate. It's a dramatic coastline. It still bears the scars of continents being ripped apart. But it also has a very special beauty it's host to giant mammals that migrate through here and tiny organisms that have adapted to living in this space. And it kind of reminds me of some of the individuals that I've met along the way on this coastline. People like Marx. There's a guy who left school early and he went to sea, sports the notion of that fact that the sea is a great teacher. And then there's the old sea dogs, like Tony, and their passionate stories and their love of being on this coastline. And one kind of hopes that that passion rubs off on the young guns. And that they can help a new generation to appreciate this coastline. And the kind of beauty, the pristine beauty that it still holds for many years to come.